So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Kelsey Jack. Uh, she'll be taking us through measurement. This is the one, I think, lecture that will that goes more into the um, randomized evaluation uh, implementation phase than any of the others. So we'll be talking a little bit about survey design, but a lot about um, you know things like data collection and, and ground realities when you're collecting data. So. Um, uh, so then the rest of the course, we're probably going to turn back more to the, the evaluation design component. All right, so where are we now? Well, we've made it through my lecture. Congratulations. Uh, now it gets exciting. So we have measurement and indicators now, and then a lot of the design aspects over the next few days. And if you're more of a visual person, we covered why evaluate. And now we'll cover measurement. And as you may have seen from the animation, measurement will cover everything from theory of change all the way through data collection. OK. So Kelsey is a professor at Tufts in the econ department. She and I met about seven years ago when she was a PhD student at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, and just around that time, I, I told you at the beginning that one of the ways that JPAL supports the research of its affiliate network is that we raise money. And we raise money so that we can have like a big pot of money for research funds and then our network, uh, affiliates from our network can apply uh, to do evaluations um, that are kind of in a particular sector. So seven years ago, we had our very first research initiative, which was the Agricultural Technology Adoption Initiative. And um, Kelsey happened to be doing some work in agriculture, some work in environment um, at the time. Actually, all of her work was either in agriculture or environment at the time. Um, and uh, she, actually, she wrote the review paper that basically served as kind of the, the framework for how we approach this issue of agricultural technology adoption, um, specifically in, in Africa and South Asia. And the basic kind of, I think, the simplified question of that initiative was, why has Africa not experienced a green revolution in the same way that you saw in like East Asia, in Latin America, and in, in parts of South Asia? So, um, so after being a postdoc with us on that initiative for a number of years, she joined Tufts. And uh, her research is mostly in environment, um, basically getting people to do things that are good for the environment. How do you do that? So I'll let Kelsey talk more about it if, if you have questions, but thank you. Great. All right. Thanks, Mark. It's always interesting to hear how other people describe you, right? <laughs> very, very informative. Um, OK, so I'm going to try to put this on, which is going to mean that I'm a little bit tethered to the table, which is good, because that'll probably keep me from pacing too much as we, as we go through this. Um, ask questions. Stop me. Interrupt as we go through this. If I start to get too quick, Mark will probably tell me to slow down. Um, there are two main components to what I'm going to try to cover in the next hour and a half. And it's a lot of material, but I think it should be, it should be interesting. So. The first is going to be the question of what to measure. And this is going to directly build on the case study that you all have seen on women as policymakers. All right, we're going to continue thinking about that case study and thinking about what that, what that tells us of how the theory of change leads to a series of, of measurement points that then we need to ask about, OK, well, we've got a series of things we'd like to measure. How do we go about doing it? Some of this, as Mark mentioned, will be very practical. We'll look at sources of measurement. We'll look at some best practices. But then in between, we'll look at some theory about concepts, about how we can screw things up if we don't word the questions correctly, for example, if we don't think about the respondent's problem, the challenges that the respondent might face. All right, so let's get into this, starting on uh, what to measure. You've thought about this case study of quotas helping women become policymakers in, uh, in, in India. Tell me a little bit about what came up in your group discussions on the theory of change and how that led to some, some measurement concepts. What were some of the things that you all discussed in, 
in your groups. Women as policymakers, how did you think about turning that program that you studied into something that was actually measurable, something that could actually be tested, whether there were impacts? What were some of the categories of things you looked at? The measurement. I sat in on some of your groups. I know there was discussion. Yeah. Uh, well, we looked at a couple ways, I guess, impact on uh, what policies get obviously approved and or funded, and then also impact on kind of women voter participation in those in those contexts. And I think one thing we at least initially thought was an assumption was that these seats that were reserved would get filled. Mm -hmm. But there's a chance that even though they're reserved, nobody even runs or gets elected. So that was one thing. Good, <laughs> good. So that, that brought up actually one thing that we could think about as sort of an assumption, mm -hmm. right? If a policy is in place, should we assume that anything is actually happening? It may not be the outcome that we care about, but we need first that policy to actually turn into some movement, right? And that can get us to these outcomes that you were mentioning of our different policies actually being implemented. What were some other things? I sat in on some of your groups. What were some other outcomes that came up? Group four sort of took the fundamental problem that was being addressed was a failure of the sort of democratic process so that measuring um, sort of the electorate's satisfaction with the policies that were implemented sort of got back to sort of making sure there was consistency in the democratic process. Good, good, good. And that comes to this really kind of fundamental question of what really is the objective of this policy in the first place, right? We have to clearly articulate that to be able to figure out what kinds of things we need to even measure to determine policy effectiveness. What were some other groups' uh, perspectives on this? I saw some very different things up on the boards in different, in different rooms as I went around to them. What were some other things that came up? Group one, who is group one? Yeah. Um, in group one, we discussed one, another assumption that women as policy makers could lead to policies geared towards women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and why might, that, why might we not see that happening? What might get in the way? Well, we talked about a couple of things, including that maybe um, women and men do have some of the same interests. Mm -hmm. So that um, another one was that um, maybe they, there might be gridlock. Okay, yeah, yeah. So things about the underlying preferences. Uh, we need some difference for there to be any impact of putting women in place versus men in place, right? It might be that there are other barriers during the process of converting a group of policymakers that look a little different from how they did before to a set of policies that look different uh, from how they did before. Any other, other points that came up? Let me walk through a version of, of how we could think about this, all right? So some of you, did, did, all, did all the groups come at this as a theory of change? I know some people jumped right into the log frame kind of version of it. So I'm going to go through both, all right? Let me start with turning this into, into something that looks like a theory of change. So in some ways, the, the outcome that I'm going to be focused on is the idea that we're going to get public goods that reflect women's preferences as a result of this program. But to get there from getting women into the policymaker role, there are a bunch of steps in between, right? And we want to think about each of those steps and what we have to assume at every single stage in this kind of logical process, this theory of change, so that that informs our measurement, all right? Okay. So first, as we've already discussed, you all brought this up, right? It has to be that men and women have different preferences. If preferences are the same across the genders, then putting women into office doesn't necessarily change the policies that are in place, right? OK, so this is something that we could think about trying to verify, OK? Now, it also, as you guys brought up, has to be that the investments that the community makes once women's preferences are being represented on the council, that those investments have to in turn reflect those preferences, right? And so there might be a variety of reasons why that wouldn't actually transpire, okay? So some might be that there's conflict within the council, right? So that the decision making doesn't actually end up reflecting women's preferences, even though the women are sitting there, 
Okay, it could be some kind of conflict, other things like that. There could be some kind of elite capture. So it could be women are sitting on the council, but they don't feel empowered. So they have different preferences, they're sitting on the council, but they don't feel like they can speak their mind, right? They don't feel like they can voice the preferences that they have that are different. It could also be that the leaders that are on the council, maybe their preferences don't actually matter that much. So imagine a situation where you have direct democracy, where the community votes on everything directly, and the council doesn't actually get to shape the policies that are in place, then you can have different preferences, you can have women that are empowered, but the policy process might not lead to a different set of policies actually being in place, right? It's a possibility. All right, so this is, you know, we could have some democracy, we could have indirect democracy. Those things are going to be necessary for the female policymakers' preferences to show up in policy, all right? Now, as was mentioned as well, it also has to be that the quotas are not just sitting there unfilled. There actually have to be women sitting on the council, right? So it may be that a policy gets passed, it may be that a policy is on the books, but it's not actually being implemented. And that could be for any number of reasons. It could be that women are not standing for election. It could be that whoever is the, the village leader is not even allowing women to stand for election. It could be, you know, again, any number of things could mean that even though we have the policy, we're not actually getting to this first step. We're not even getting off the ground, right? So this theory of change, we sort of went backwards, right? We started with, with the outcome in some ways and worked our way back to what is the policy. But if we think about starting with this policy, there are all of these steps along this kind of causal change, chain that we're going to think about as this theory of change. How do we get from a policy on the books to an outcome that we actually care about? And if we want to do more than just throw up our hands and say, we did the policy, we didn't get our goal, we also want to understand something about why or why not we did or didn't achieve our, our goal, right? Documenting this whole map is really crucial, okay? And the women as policymakers, did you guys all get a chance to look at the brief? So that brief does a nice job of showing the fact that it's also interesting to try to understand what was happening at each of these intermediate stages, right? That it's kind of black box if we just document things at the policy stage and at the outcome stage, these intermediate changes can be very, very informative of what's actually happening on the ground. And you'll hear later in the course about this qu questions about generalizability, right? Do our findings from a particular period in time in India generalize to Nicaragua, right? Could we think about running this policy in another setting and expect that it would, that it would work? Documenting this whole map can really help us understand why or why not it worked in a particular case, which can have clear implications for whether it's going to work in another case. Now, obviously, the generalizability problem is a whole lecture, so there's more to it than that. But, uh, but that's just another plug for why this step is really important in designing your, your policy. Now, let's look at how these guys actually went about trying to do some measurement at each of these stages. Okay, So this first point, Women have different preferences. Actually, I should, I should hide this. Pretend you didn't see that. Um, what were some of the suggestions that you all came up with of, of documenting whether uh, preferences are actually different between men and women? Household survey, anybody? You know, maybe, just, just perhaps? Yeah, OK, good. So we could certainly do a household survey. We could survey men and women, ask them about their priorities, ask them about the policies that they feel are most important for their community, and see if you get different answers, right? See if there are differences in preferences. What about this question about whether investments reflect women's preferences? How might you measure that? Did you guys have any ideas? <laughs> you could do another survey, sure. So you could, you could ask people in the community about what public investments are happening. Certainly a possibility. If you're already out there surveying, you might as well add a few questions on that. Okay. What else? What else might you want to do? Yeah. I would map the, the budget onto that household survey to kind of see what the 
if there was a gender divide in the household survey, how the budget matches up to that. Good. So you could just, I mean, in some ways, the most direct measure of where is public investment happening is some kind of a community budget, some kind of a public budget, right? Where is the money being spent? OK, good. Um, what these researchers actually did is a few different things. Um, so they did a village leader survey. So not, not so different, but a slightly different respondent group. They asked village leaders what policies have been passed, what money is being spent, right? Um, they did what's called a participatory, participatory resource appraisal. Basically went in and tried to figure out where were resources going. And if there was a public budget that they could look at, that would presumably be part of this. But they could also go around and just try to look at, you know, what kind of shape is the school in? Uh, are pupils in the school? What does irrigation look like uh, in this village? You know, so they can actually just go around and document evidence. Do we see things that look like public investments across a variety of different measures? OK. Um, for, let's see, on the, the other thing that they could learn with this village leader survey is they could see whether the leader's preferences actually matter. Okay, So they could document at the leader level what is it that you're trying to achieve here. right? What do you think are the most important uh, priorities for public spending in your, in your village? What do you think the biggest needs are? Right? So document a bit. In some ways, this leader preferences matter. Are they similar to, uh, to the preferences that you see in the household? survey. Okay. They could also use administrative data. This is the, the public budget idea. They could also use administrative data to determine whether the policy was even being implemented on the ground. Right? Are there women in these seats? And they could probably, depending on what the administrative data looks like, they could use that as well to see how many women were even standing for election. Right? So not just to see the outcomes, but also these, these immediate outputs, but also to see whether the sort of if there's a failure, where's the failure coming from? Is it that women aren't even standing for election? But then you could also perhaps use a household survey for that. You could ask people, you know, why are why you know women, why are you standing for election or why aren't you standing for election, right? So the point is that this project that you all have looked at, this policy that you've looked at, the researchers pulled a number of different measurement approaches together to try to really cover this whole map of the theory of change. Okay? And this gives them a much richer picture of what's actually happening on the ground, gives them a much better sense of sort of the overall arc of getting from this initial policy on paper to some outcomes that we might really care about. All right? OK, questions on this? Yeah. Yeah, I have a general question mm -hmm. here. When we use theory of change, um, I don't really see here, I see a map, yes, but I don't see the causal link from how you get from the before to the after, which I thought is the core of the theory of change. Good. And so are you today, is best practice not to show kind of one leads to the next, which mm -hmm. leads to the next, mm -hmm. and then you mm -hmm. kind of split somehow actions versus assumptions, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then you go into the measurement part. OK, I, I feel OK, like sure. So I think the way that we can use this, that what I'm showing you here today, to sort of think about it as a causal chain in some ways, is just work in this direction, OK? So we need the policy, once the policy is in place, that needs to cause a change in terms of the composition of the council. Okay? That change in the composition of the council, in turn, needs to cause this change into, in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the actual policies that are being implemented. Now, what these two branches are about are assumptions. Okay? These two branches are about making sure that this failure, if there is a failure, in this particular case there was not, but were there a failure to get from more women on the council to a change in the public goods that are being provided, we want to test out our assumptions about even the, the causal chain to begin. You know, does this change lead to this outcome? Well, we're assuming that there are differences in preferences. We're also assuming that women can affect, once they're on the council, that they can affect the public investments. If either of these assumptions fails, 
that might be the reason that we don't actually get there. Now, there could be other things. This is a very simplified uh, version of what's probably actually going on on the ground, but hopefully that helps this kind of match uh, what's in your head a little bit better. And I'm using this really to start to get us into the measurement uh, discussion, to get us thinking about what would we actually need to measure and then how would we do it. Um, but does that, does that help a bit? OK, good. All right, so. Um, we missed one. We're going to use some village transcripts, all right? Um, and, and, and this is going to help us get a sense of whether women are actually speaking up, whether women are actually more empowered, OK? OK, good. Let's turn this into a, a log frame. I know that's what you were working on in your, in your groups to some extent. Uh, let's think about how we would go from that theory of change, that kind of general causal map, right, to turning that into some things that we could start to to measure. OK. So here we have final impacts that we would like to see, right? We have some outcomes that come a little bit before the final impacts. We have some outputs, we're even closer to the beginning of our story, and some inputs, OK? Across the top, we can think about our objectives, our indicators, this is starting to get us to, to the measurement problem, how we're going to verify those indicators, and then we want to be very explicit here about what assumptions we're making. All right? um, you, can, you can look at this, we don't need to walk through every single cell here, but what's going to be important as you start to think about moving these tools to your own organization is this is, this is probably a huge simplification, right? There are probably many, many more steps that you would want to think about. How are we going to document this? Is this important for us to, to document? So let's take an example. Let's think about the project objective here, the outcome, right? In this case, it could be that women are voicing their political views, that they're actually taking a stand, that they're trying to get policies that they care about into place. We could measure this with the number of times that a woman spoke in a council meeting. Okay? Now, there are lots of other ways that we could think about measuring it, right? That's just one. Okay? So here, that's what I've listed. But you could think about if you were doing this, you might want to list many of them and think about trading off, well, which ones are going to be the best? And that's what we're going to talk about next, is how we, how we might evaluate whether this is a good one to use or should we use something else. To be able to assess this indicator, we need some, some, some tool, right? We need something. We need some information. And so in this case, it could be a transcript from the village meeting. That might be what we would use. And we would also want to think about, well, what assumption is embedded in using this source of verification, right, to get us back to our objective? It's that women are developing some independent views, that we're actually hearing women's voices more in these, in these meetings. That's an assumption. That's what we're ultimately worried about testing. OK, good. So before we get into the details then of how do we start to develop these indicators, how do we start to think about verification, how do we really drill into each of those, these cells? Because that's really what this lecture is going to be about. OK, um, let me show you what these guys found. Um, OK. So did you guys talk about the results of the study? All right, let's, let's go through it then. OK, this study took place in two states in India. And the results are a little different across states. So we're going to break it down into state by state results. Um, we'll look at the issue. We're going to actually look at some of the measurements. So we're going to look at whether this issue in the household survey came up as a priority for women and for men. OK, so we'll actually start to unpack a little bit uh, this question of our preferences different, all right? But that's also going to be important because the prediction is not that a particular type of policy gets implemented. The prediction is that policies that are important to women are more likely to be implemented. And so to even test that prediction, we need to know something about is this issue a priority for men or for women, all right? OK, good. Now, the first issue is drinking water. What do we see? We see that in West Bengal, 
it's a little bit of a priority for women, a little bit more of a priority for women than for men. In Rajasthan, it's also just a little bit more of a priority for women than for men. What you can also see from this is that in Rajasthan, it's much more of a priority overall for everybody, right? So it may be that in some places, one thing's just overall more important, but what really matters is how it breaks down between women and men to be able to test this prediction that policies that are a priority for women are more likely to get implemented, right? Okay, good. We're gonna look at this by measuring the number of drinking water facilities. Yes? How would you uh, household could be done? Was it by mail? Was it door to door? I can make an educated guess here, but it could be wrong. Um, my guess, most of the projects uh, like this that take place in rural developing country settings end up having door-to-door -door surveys with uh, enumerators, so it's not self-administered, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in, in a few slides. Importantly for this survey, I am almost certain that they would have had separate surveys for men and for women, so that women were being surveyed without their husband sitting there telling them what to say, right? And in most cases, you would also want to match the gender of the surveyor with the gender of the respondent so that the respondent feels comfortable voicing their opinions. So again, I don't know for sure that that's exactly what they did, but my guess is, is that's probably how it was administered. And those are all important considerations that, that you would want to, to bring into the survey design process, right? And we'll talk about that as well. That's going to be a question of, are we getting some bias in the responses that we get to this survey because of something about how the survey is being run? OK. OK, so we're going to measure drinking water by the number of facilities, the number of places that people can get improved drinking water, clean drinking water. Um, we're going to look at this as a measure in the quota villages relative to the control villages, relative to the villages where the quotas were not in place, okay? So what I'll show you is the difference. And what you see is that in West Bengal, we had about nine more drinking water facilities on average in villages where there was a quota system than in villages where there was no quota system. And in Rajasthan, there were about two and a half more uh, drinking water facilities in villages that had a, uh, a quota system. These stars are telling us that this result is statistically significant, okay? Um, so there was an impact there, right? Let's go through a few more of these a little bit more quickly. Another thing that I looked at were road improvements. Now road improvements, unlike drinking water, were more of a, uh, a, a priority well, we're also more of a priority for women in West Bengal, but in Rajasthan, they were more of a priority for men, okay? So you can see here why it starts to be important to break this out by state, because women's preferences might look different across the states. So you actually get different predictions here on what you would expect to see. What do they see? Exactly what you would predict, right? So they see in the state where uh, road improvement is more of a priority for men, you actually get a little bit less of it once women are on the council. Whereas in West Bengal, where road improvements are a little bit more of a priority for women, you actually get a little bit more of it. Okay? So you can start to see why breaking it out in this way, why thinking about all of the measurements starts to become very important. Irrigation effects are not statistically significant in either case. Right? Now we could think about why that outcome might be a little bit harder to move, why that one might look a little bit different. And finally, education. Uh, in both cases, interesting, probably a little bit in, in contrast with some of our priors, we see that education is more of a priority for men in both states than it is for women. Okay. And in both of these cases, we don't see much. This is measured as whether there's an informal education center in the village. Okay. We could talk more about why they're measuring it that way versus something else. Uh, this is, this is what, we, what we have here. This education line is an important, uh, I think, reminder that our priors just might be wrong, all right? That it's important in this case to go out there and document what household preferences are because if we just come in with some prior that, oh, women care about education, it could be, you know, we see this result, 
But that's actually completely consistent with what we would expect if this is more of a priority for men, right? Okay, good. Questions on, uh, on, on the results here that I'm showing you? Um, that's a great question. I actually don't know the answer to it. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. So I don't know whether this, do you, do you know Mark actually? Um, I think by virtue of just comparing the treatment and the control group, it kind of gets that new investment and then yeah. the control group will have about the same amount as, as the treatment at baseline. And so. Yeah, but I think we'll, yeah, we'll talk a little, I mean, I think this is bringing up a, a question that we will talk a little bit about, which is when do you want to collect your measurement? Because to really know whether, it could be that investments are going up everywhere. And so we can't really say that these are all new investments. It's just that they're a little bit faster in some places than in others. And to do Mark's comparison of just control group versus treatment group, we just need the data at the end to be able to make that comparison. But to answer your question about are these new investments or not, we would also need some baseline data, right? So depending on exactly what question we want to ask, we need to think about in advance, well, to answer that version of it, I'm going to need both baseline and inline data. OK, great. Let's turn then from this case study of women as policymakers to a bit more of a general discussion of how are we actually going to start to measure these indicators, these outcomes, these intermediate uh, measures that we need to put together an impact evaluation. I'm going to talk here a little bit about uh, sources of measurement, okay? Different places that we could actually get the data that we need in order to, uh, to do our measurement. But the important thing is going to be, as you've seen just now, to start with the theory of change. So start with what do we expect this program to do? Without that, it's very hard to figure out what should we even be measuring, right? What so data sources should we use? We need to know what it is we want to measure. The theory of change is where we get uh, those ideas, all right, where we get that information. OK, so the first order question and measurement is going to be, what do you want to measure? That's where the theory of change comes in. The second question uh, that you can then ask is, well, what data are we going to collect? How are we going to go about actually making these measurements? Where are you going to get these data, right? Where are we going to find this and when? So this question of do we do it at the beginning of the project, at the end of the project, all throughout the project? Um, the answers to these questions are going to depend in many ways on the particular program you're trying to run, the particular thing it is that you're trying to evaluate. But what I want to do with you is put some principles on the table that can help guide you when it comes to implementing uh, some measurement tool in your particular organization. OK, so where can we get data? Now, if we think back to what economists have been doing for a very, very long time, a lot of that looked like, let's go, this is actually not, not the best picture to illustrate this point, but let's just go download some publicly available data. Let's go find you know, some census data, or let's go find some data from a large-scale survey that's already been run. Let's go find some publicly available information, download it, that into our computer, run some regressions, and come up with some big statements about how the world works, OK? That was fine, but that limits a lot of the questions that we can even try to ask to ones that could be answered with publicly available data, right? What we're going to be talking about here today is collecting your own data. All right. Um, that said, there's some other great sources of secondary data that can be very, very helpful, especially for those of you um, that are sitting in city governments, that are sitting in organizations that are collecting a lot of administrative records anyway. Thinking about those not just as measuring what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, but as data sources, as things that might help you answer a question about, is our program actually having impact? So those might be administrative data sources. So for example, in a lot of my uh, work right now, I'm working with the city of Cape Town to look at their water and electricity uh, uh, provision to, to residents of the city. They send out bills every month, right? To them, those bills are about collecting revenue. To me, those bills are. Uh, an amazing data source, OK? So these types of administrative records that currently might just be sitting on some server somewhere 
can actually be very, very useful as outcome data. Okay? Um, there may be other types of secondary data that are being collected very regularly. It could be sales data, it could be uh, other types of, of monitor data, hospital data, other things like that are all these secondary data sources that you don't have to go out and physically collect because they're being collected all the time, right? So thinking about how these fit into your log frame, into your theory of change as ways of verifying different steps of, 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 the, of the theory of change can be very helpful. Okay, what we're gonna talk a lot about though today are data collected by, uh, by researchers. We're gonna call these primary data in contrast with secondary data. What that means, it's primary because the researchers are going out and collecting it. When I say researchers, I really mean whoever in your organization or group is wearing the evaluation hat, all right? So that may not be some outside researcher, that may be one of you, all right? Um, all this means is that we're collecting these data for the first time rather than obtaining already existing data. All right, let's try to think about this a little bit here, uh, categorize these things a little bit. Okay, so let's think about information that's actually provided by a person. I'm gonna refer to this as a respondent in many cases, right? This is first-hand information that an individual is, is providing. It could be through a survey, but it also could be you're sitting down and taking an exam, right? You all did a, a little test this morning of, uh, of your expectations for the course, right? You were providing some primary data in that exercise, right? You knew that someone was collecting it, you were filling out a form with the expectation that that information was going to somebody that was, and it was going to be used, okay? So this is information about a person, household, possessions, it could be any number of things, it could be measures of your expectations, okay? Now some of this is going to be provided directly in response to a test, in response to a questionnaire, in response to something like that, but it also may be that some of this is automatically generated, okay? And some of this, when it starts to be used as data, becomes a little bit controversial. There's a lot of discussion right now in the United States, at least, about confidentiality and things like that. But in many cases, people know. You know when you go through one of these automatic toll booths that that is being recorded, that there's information being captured at that moment, right? And that information is going to somebody, right? The question of exactly who it's going to, that's where some of the, the debate comes up. But there's usually very little ambiguity that information is actually being collected at that moment, right? Okay, now, in contrast, there may also be information that is not about a person, a household, an activity, an action, something like that. So it could be that there are pollution monitors that go around and collect information. So again, where this is information being provided by a person, being captured by a person, so it may not be automatic. Maybe they, somebody has to go out and visit the pollution facilities and actually capture some data. Okay, so this could be an active data collection process, but it's not necessarily about a person. Okay. Um, on the other hand, of course, some of that is going to be automatically collected all the time on an ongoing basis. So some sensor that's out there just logging things you know, increasingly at a second level, second to second level, minute to minute level, sometimes less frequently, all right? Okay, so you can think about this kind of matrix of types and sources of, of, of data collection, right? Um, we're gonna spend a lot of time sort of in this quadrant up here, but don't get too hung up on that. If you're in an organization that uses a lot of secondary data that's either being collected automatically about individuals or perhaps not even about people, household possessions. All of those, all of the uh, measurement questions that we're gonna be talking about today are equally relevant, right? So all of the concepts that we're gonna be going through are equally relevant. All right, the reason that we're gonna talk a lot about data collection on people is because in many social programs we end up needing to collect primary data. And unlike with secondary data where your hands are kind of tied, it's out there and if it works you can use it, right? 
the question of how do you design a data collection instrument? How do you design your, your data collection process so that it is as good as it can possibly be? That's a much more, the, the onus is really on you to figure that out, okay? So that's where we're going to focus the discussion. Surveys are very, very common. Many of the projects that, that, that JPAL gets involved in involve new survey data collection, all right? But this certainly is not limited to surveys. We can think about exams or tests. If you're in education in particular, a lot of the primary data collection is through test scores, is through exams that are being taken in, in schools, in after school training facilities, even on the job training. Often you see, uh, you see tests, evaluations of whether somebody has actually learned anything new. Um, but it could be something more creative. It could be that we're going to have people play a game and see how they behave, see the choices that they're actually making, right? The women as policymakers case, one of the things that they used were vignettes where they varied the identity of one of the actors in the vignette, whether it was a male or a female, and then they asked respondents to rate certain outcomes from the vignette, and they could assess bias that way. They could see whether the viewers of the vignette thought it was a more effective interaction if it was a man than if it was a woman, right? So vignettes could potentially help get at things that are more difficult to measure in a survey, things like biases, right? Direct observation, potentially, maybe just viewing what people are doing, how they're engaging with a facility, with, uh, with some resource that's been provided. Diaries, other logs that people are keeping themselves can be very, very useful, especially if you want more high-frequency kind of outcomes, asking people to keep track of consumption or expenditures or other things like that uh, themselves can be very, very helpful. It also may be that we're not quite ready to turn our questions into a survey questionnaire that's being administered by somebody else. Maybe we're still at more of a qualitative stage of trying to understand what's really going on. Maybe the, the questions don't fit into easily sort of categorized uh, responses. And so more open-ended data collection involving focus groups or involving open-ended interviews may be necessary, right? So this is just a long laundry list. I'm sure you can think of other things that could be on this list. These all fit into this category of active data collection on people, on their attitudes, on their opinions, on their assets, on their, you know, all sorts of different things that you can measure using this diversity of measurement tools. And what we're going to turn to in just a moment are some questions about what make these good, right? What is it that makes, whether it's a survey or some kind of a diary, what, what, what things should you be thinking about at the design stage to ensure that you're really capturing what it is you want to capture with this data collection, okay? Any questions at this point? Okay, good. There's more. We can think about different ways of collecting these data, okay? So we could think about interviewer administered or enumerator administered, where someone's going around uh, trying to ask the question of, you know, who is administering the household surveys in um, in the in the women as policymakers case. Um, I answered her that this was probably interviewer administered. It used to be that almost all of these were paper-based. Somebody was going around in the field in India with a piece of paper and a, and a pen, and then a rainstorm would hit, and your data would be in jeopardy, and you know, all sorts of, of, of logistical complications with that. Increasingly, we're seeing more and more com computer-assisted interviewing going on, which raises some very exciting possibilities of having much more dynamic types of interfaces where the questions that pop up depend on previous answers that the respondent has given. So some of you may have some experience with these types of, uh, of data collection tools. In some cases, it also may be that sending an interviewer around is very expensive and doesn't actually add that much value in which case telephone-based or internet-based surveys are another, another possibility. Um, the point here is that there are lots of different ways of doing this. There's not a right way and a wrong way. It depends on the circumstances. In other cases, it may be that self-administered surveys are a possibility. Often in developing countries, this is hard because of low levels of literacy, but many of you are working in 
settings where literacy levels are very high, in which case a self-administered survey can help overcome some of the barriers that we're going to be talking about, including that in many cases respondents don't necessarily want to tell somebody something that they're willing to write down on paper. All right? So self-administered uh, surveys can be very helpful. They can be very helpful as well for high frequency data collection. If you want to know what time somebody went to bed every night, sending a surveyor around and saying, tell me over the last month what time you went to bed every night. So it's not the easiest question to answer, right? Uh, if instead, every morning you write down what time you went to sleep the night before, that becomes a little bit, a little bit easier, all right? Okay. Um, now, we've briefly touched on this. I'm going through a lot of concepts a little bit quickly. This other question of when do you actually do all this data collection, there are a bunch of different points in a project when you could do it. A baseline, when does a baseline happen? What makes something a baseline survey? What are we going to think about as a baseline? Before the intervention. Yeah, so before the intervention. And for it to be a true baseline, this is actually a little tough because it really needs to be before stuff has started to happen. Okay? The baseline can be very helpful. I'll come back to this in just a second. An inline, when does an inline happen? After the intervention. And how is that distinct from a follow up? Yeah, so, right, right, right. So in some ways we can think about the inline as capturing the moment when the intervention ends. But it may be that some of these programs have much longer run outcomes that we care about as well, right? The women as policymakers case, there are certain things that immediately after a woman is elected or at the end of her five year term, we might expect there to be some outcomes. But if it's educational attainment for young girls, we might need to come back 10 years later and try to see whether there's been any movement. So that, I mean, that's a very long run example. In other cases, the follow up would just be one year or five years or something like that later. During the intervention, probably pretty obvious when that happens, right? Uh, happens during the intervention. And the during the intervention measurement can serve some different purposes. So part of it can just be the kind of intervention monitoring and evaluation. Did things even happen, right? Did your mosquito nets, nets actually get out to the village or not? That's kind of the standard monitoring and evaluation. Are we doing what we told the donors we were going to do, right? Um, but it also may be that some of our log frame, some of our theory of change really depends on certain things happening at different points in time, right? And in that case, collecting some data at intermediate stages may be very important that just the baseline and the follow-up are insufficient. Now, you're going to hear a lot this week about randomized controlled trials. One of the beautiful, beautiful things about a randomized controlled trial is in theory, you really just need the outcome data, and then you can compare your treatment group and your control group and figure out the impact that way. So the simplest answer to the question of did this program have impact, if it is a randomized trial, you really only need the inline or in some cases the follow-up data. But the baseline can be very powerful because one of the things that the baseline can, two things that the baseline can do, one is answer this question of what underlying trends were happening. So it may be that the whole world is just getting much worse, and it's just that the treatment group is getting worse a little bit less rapidly than the control group. And that may be a very different takeaway than everybody's getting much better, and the treatment group's just getting better a little bit more rapidly, or the control group's totally stagnant, and the treatment group's getting better a little bit more rapidly, right? Those are three things where if you just look at the inline or the follow-up data are going to give you the same gap between the control group and the treatment group, but they're coming from very different places. And depending on sort of the nature of the question, it may be very important to understand these underlying trends, right? Without a baseline, you're not necessarily going to be able to do that. Now, the other thing that a baseline can do that can be very powerful is it lets you know things about different groups before the program arrived. So that can let you answer things that we, we're gonna, we can call heterogeneous treatment effects, or you could call subgroup impacts, right? That it might be that in the village, educated women changed their attitudes toward female policymakers, 
while uneducated women didn't. But if the program also had an impact on female education, then what we really want is to know at baseline who was educated and who wasn't to be able to make statements about subgroups, right? Because subgroup composition could be affected by the program itself. And if we only come along at the end line and assign you to a particular group, educated versus uneducated, for example, we might be missing the fact that your group status, your group type, might have actually changed because of the program, right? So this kind of subgroup analysis of who is actually impacted, that relies very heavily on knowing at baseline who was in which subgroup, okay? Okay, now clearly there are a lot of considerations into when exactly are you going to want to collect data, how exactly are you going to organize all of that. We could spend a whole lecture on it. Um, so instead of trying to do better justice, I'm just going to move right on. Okay. Um, but actually, before I do, are there are there questions on this? Yeah. Can you talk at all about uh, pre-balancing? In a later lecture, correct? Yes. So um, that I gave you two good reasons to think about baseline data. Another good reason is that the baseline is actually a very good way to figure out if your assignment to treatment and control actually worked or not, right? It helps you do it because you can see the characteristics of the groups, um, and it also helps you check whether you've done it correctly. Um, but, but that will be uh, brought up and covered very extensively in another lecture. Okay, so let me, before we turn to more of the conceptual components of how do we think about measurement, because that's really what this lecture is about, let me pause for just a second and raise some of the ethical concerns that often come up when we start to talk about randomized trials. Now, this is covered in the lecture on measurement because measurement is often where the researchers get involved. All right? So if we're thinking about a policy, we're thinking about evaluating the policy, it may be that that's something that the government's just going to do researchers or no researchers. right? Um, and in those cases, depending on exactly what the government's up to, there may not be a big effort to get permission, right? So think about a program that's rolling out computers to elementary schools, right? The government is not necessarily going to send around a permission form to parents to say, is it okay if we put computers in your child's school? They're just gonna do it, right? Um, and in many cases, we're fairly comfortable with policies happening people not necessarily opting into them or not because it's a public policy, right? Public, by definition, in some ways, means if you're covered by it in terms of your, you know, your, your, your group, your location, whatever it is, then you're at least eligible for it, right? Now, where the researchers come in, that starts to change a little bit. So um, often, I think, where we get uncomfortable with the idea of a randomized trial is the idea that there's some intervention happening that people are not necessarily aware of, that they haven't necessarily consented to. Now, if we're thinking about evaluating social programs, in many cases, those programs are going to be happening anyway, right? And it may be scarce resources that determines that some people are getting it and some are not. Maybe a variety of other things that determines that some people are getting it and some are not. Uh, I think when you talk about randomization a little bit more, you'll talk about the fact that in many cases, the fairest thing to do is to randomize at the beginning, learn something about whether this is actually effective, learn something about for whom is it effective, and then make your decisions about scale up. Now, I think it's worth, though, clarifying that uh, where research, when researchers get involved, there's some very strict guidelines that determine how research practices happen. In many cases, these are going to be layered on top of existing programs or policies that are being rolled out. But the researchers are governed by the data in, in terms of their data collection, in terms of the data that they collect from people, even with secondary data, in terms of at what point do people have to give informed consent that their data are actually being used, that their data are actually being looked at by researchers. This all falls under something called the Belmont Principles, um, which has been in place for several decades. This really was a reaction to some very sketchy practices by academics back in the day, right? And from that, 
we developed a series of principles that govern how research actually takes place and the, 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 the principles that researchers have to follow. The first of these is, uh, is respect for persons. And what this is really about is informed consent. It's about the idea that individuals have some agency over what information about them is being taken by researchers, being used by researchers. So while the government may not be asking for permission at, any, at every given stage of rolling out a public policy, that when researchers get involved and start to obtain data from individuals, there needs to be an informed consent stage. Okay? The second principle is beneficence. And by this, what the Belmont Principles really means is that the benefits of the research, what is being gained by society, outweighs the potential harms. All right? This doesn't mean that we can never do any research that puts anybody at harm, or at risk of harm, sorry. Intentional harm is pretty much off the table as far as I know, but that, that there's any risk of harm. It, but it does require that, that there are serious gains and that those trade-offs have to be weighed at every step of the research process, right? Um, in many cases, the research is very low risk, but as soon as it starts to get into sensitive topics, right? As soon as even, even you know, the case of women policymakers, there's potential there for conflict. There's potential there for you know, difficulties within the village, but the gain of evaluating, the gain of collecting those data and actually seeing whether it makes a difference or not is very large, the potential gain, right? And so benefits versus costs, okay? That's the beneficence principle. Finally, the third principle is justice. What this refers to is that the population that's part of the study has to stand to benefit from it. So there's a very clear uh, rule at US universities, at least, that we cannot do experiments on prisoners with exactly this idea that they do not stand to gain from the results of the research. Right? So justice means that the beneficiaries have to, uh, the, sorry, the participants in the research have to be potential beneficiaries, at least potential. OK. okay. Um, to implement all of this, all of the researchers that are part of JPAL, um, many researchers that you may interact with, all are governed by institutional review boards. All universities in the United States at least, at least have these, and they're responsible for working with the researchers to make sure that the study protocols adhere to these, uh, to these principles. Okay. So questions on this. There'll be, I think, room and opportunity for some questions about the randomization stage. This is really meant to be about the measurement stage and the principles that guide measurement. Really informed consent is the, is, is the big one. OK, good. So let's, uh, let's keep moving along then and get into the real meat of the lecture, which is how do we measure and we're going to start with the concept, OK? What, what do we even mean when we're thinking about measurement? What are, we, what are we even trying to worry about? We're zooming way back here. All right, what is this concept of measurement? OK, say we are running an early childhood development intervention, all right? What we would really love is to just have brains, right? That's what we really care about. Is this early childhood? intervention actually affecting kids' brains. Now, typically we're not actually, I mean, increasingly we could do MRIs and things like that and try to see into people's brains. But what we tend to think about is intelligence. We want to know, does this early childhood intervention actually affect kids' intelligence? Now, intelligence is a little bit of a tricky thing, right? This is a construct. This is not something that we can go out and measure. Intelligence is it's kind of abstract thing. And we use it as sort of a typically a shared construct, but if we really got into a deep discussion right now, each of you might have a different idea about what intelligence really means, right? So in this sense, it's a, it's a construct, okay? Our goal is gonna be the bullseye, right? We really want to try to figure out how to measure this construct of intelligence so that we know if our early childhood intervention actually affected these kids' intelligence. Okay. 
One way that people often try to measure intelligence is with an IQ test. Okay, now IQ tests can be a little controversial. People often think that they're biased for various reasons. It may be that certain groups are more predisposed to do well on them because of other exposure, because of other things like that. They can be affected by literacy, by numeracy. This is an example of a, of a Ravens test, something that's often used for low literacy level populations as, a, as an IQ measure. The IQ test is going to be our indicator, right? Our goal is for our indicator to accurately measure our construct. If there's some bias, it might not actually fall on the bullseye, okay? So if this IQ test is only an imperfect measure of our true construct, whatever that means, the construct thing is a little bit vague, right? But if our indicator is an imperfect measure of this construct, then we might be a little bit away from the bullseye. Now, we're going to go out and do a bunch of IQ tests on these kids, and that's going to give us some results. Right? We're going to see their IQ scores. And those eventually are going to be our data. Right? That's what we're going to analyze. That's what we're going to use to see, did this early childhood intervention actually affect intelligence? Now, you can see the problem here. Right? We've got this underlying construct, which itself, to begin with, is a little bit vague. We're going to layer on top of that some indicators, which might be biased for all sorts of reasons. And then we're going to try to actually implement it. And maybe some of these kids are being tested first thing in the morning when some of them are still asleep and others are really high performing. Some of them are going to be tested in the afternoon when everybody's either had a good day or a bad day already. And so some of them are going to you know, maybe not do as well. So there's also going to be this stage between the indicator, which might be you know, perfectly good, and the data that we actually get out of it, which is another stage at which things might get screwed up. Right? Now let's think about another, another example here. All right. We might also want to think about, does this early childhood intervention affect stress levels in kids? Okay. Again, stress is going to be our construct. right? Stress is this kind of vague thing. It turns out we tend to think that cortisol levels are di directly responsive to underlying stress. Right? So this might be a relatively more accurate measure of the construct that we're after than IQ was of intelligence, right? So cortisol may be very responsive to stress. Stress goes up, cortisol goes up. But it also may be that cortisol levels are also very influenced by other things, by time of the day, by blood chemistry, by other things like that, which is going to mean that even though our indicator in this case is a much better approximation of our underlying construct, the data that we get out of it may still have a bunch of extra noise that's been introduced by testing procedures, by data collection procedures. OK, let's try to formalize this a little bit more. All right, so we've got our constructs. In most cases, this is what we are actually after. This is what we want our programs to affect. OK, we care about the constructs, but they're almost impossible to measure. So instead, we're going to rely on indicators. Okay? Now, these indicators are going to be, in many cases, things that have been used elsewhere. In some cases, maybe we're going to have to develop them ourselves. But then there's going to be this really important stage of going from the indicator to the data, which is, how does the data collection actually happen? What is the response that we're getting that delivers the information on this indicator? Okay. Now, things can be difficult at all stages. So our first uh, question for you guys, you guys all have your little clickers? All right. Our first question for you guys is going to be empowerment. Many programs claim to affect empowerment, right? The women as policymakers case. One of the possible outcomes was maybe women are going to be more empowered. What do you think empowerment is? Is it a construct, an indicator, a response, some data? Or Kelsey, I have no idea what you're talking about. All right, good. 
All right, so I would agree, I think empowerment's a construct. I mean, think about it. How would you measure empowerment? We need an indicator, right? So empowerment itself is this underlying construct that we would like to affect, but we're going to need to turn that into something else to actually be able to collect some data on it. All right, let's, let's look at another one. OK, what about blood pressure is 110 over 71? Is that a construct, an indicator, a response, some data, or again, Kelsey, I have no idea what you're going on about here. What do you think? All right, we've done almost everybody. OK, good. Most of you think this is data. Yeah. So this is the actual thing that we get out of the blood pressure tests, right? This is our data. Good. The C is also, I, I kind of thought maybe it was C as well, right? It's kind of somewhere in between, right? So this is an individual response to this indicator. The response is getting the data out of the blood pressure cuff or whatever it is that's collecting the, the, the blood pressure. This actual number is going to be our data, right? So this is what we are recording. This is after the response, we've got something on paper that we can start to analyze, OK? OK, good. Uh, one more, maybe two more. Discrimination is? OK, totally agree. I think discrimination is a construct. Very hard to think about how to measure something. It's this kind of, again, thing many programs would like to affect. But we're going to need some indicators to get there. OK, one more. Kilograms of rice per hectare. What do you think? Construct, indicator, response, data, no idea. Good, OK, I agree. I think that kilograms of rice per hectare is an indicator. What is it an indicator of? Agricultural productivity, right? Something like that, some kind of underlying construct. Now, we're going to measure that in some parts of sub-Saharan Africa. We might get averages of less than 1,000 kilograms per hectare. Some parts of the rich world, we might get outcomes upward of 10,000 kilograms per hectare, OK? Those would be our data. Our response would come from going out and figuring out whether it's through a survey, whether it's through some on-field measurement, how do we actually collect that information, what responses are we getting to this indicator for the underlying construct of agricultural productivity, OK? Awesome. You guys are doing great. Um, OK, let's think then about these indicators, how they map on to our constructs. And we'll think a little bit as well about, uh, about the responses and sort of that chain that I showed you before. Um, we're going to have kind of two groups of concepts. I've put a few different terms up here. Some of them may be more familiar to you than others. Okay, So we can think first about accuracy, right? Again, our goal is the construct, which is at the bullseye. Okay, So we can think about how well our data, each of these dots are a piece of data, right? How well those data fall over our construct, how accurate they are. If they're away from it, we might think they're biased, right? And we're in particular going to use the term validity to think about the mapping of an indicator onto a construct. Okay? So this is referred to often as, as indicator validity or construct validity. Do we actually have a good mapping from the indicator that we're trying to measure to the underlying construct, which in many ways is what we actually care about? Okay? In many cases, we don't care about the indicator other than the fact that it's measuring some construct. Right? So we need these two things to really layer one on top of the other. Right? What we would like is something that looks a little bit more like that right-hand picture than something that is off on the side. Okay? 
So our goal is going to be to think about indicators that are valid. All right? Now, this is not a binary problem. An indicator is not valid or invalid, right? It may be over here, it may be here, it may be here, it may be here. Hopefully, it's going to be right over the bullseye. That's our goal. Okay? All right. Now, we're also going to be worried about how spread out these data points are. Okay? So think about the IQ example. Or actually, think about the, the cortisol is probably a better example. Think about the cortisol example. It may be that it's actually you know, going to give us some very precise information, but perhaps it's going to be pulled off to the side because of something that time of day, for example, when it's actually being, uh, being, being collected. Um, actually, that probably would just move things around a little bit. We still would be getting a very accurate measure. So the precision is just going to be how concentrated are the points, how well is the data that we're collecting actually matching the indicator, but then if the indicator is bad, it could be that we're getting some very precise measures, but they're not over our bullseye at all. all right? So we're going to think about this as the reliability, both of the response, okay, so we'll talk about response reliability, and also of the indicator. All right? So when individuals are responding to the indicator, are you getting something that maps on to the indicator itself, and then in addition, is the indicator actually mapping on to, uh, to the bullseye? Okay, so a good example um, of, of both of these is we could think about collecting, if we care about something about nutritional outcomes, right? We could think about collecting height and weight. Height and weight are pretty precise, right? Put me up on a, on a doctor's thing and they're gonna say I'm a five foot three. And you go from doctor's office to doctor's office, they're pretty much all gonna tell you I'm five foot three, and that's probably right, okay? So that may be very accurate. They can collect weight. But then if we turn that into body mass index, right, which is often used as a nutritional, uh, as an outcome in nutritional studies, well, then it starts to be a little bit harder. That may be a very precise measure, but you could have a high BMI because you're overweight. You could be, have a high BMI because you're stunted, meaning you're very short. You could have a high BMI because you've been going to the gym every day, right? All of those things could give you a high BMI, but they represent something very, very different about your nutritional status. So that's a case where we have a very precise measurement, right? But if our goal is to understand something about nutritional status, we're nowhere near the bullseye, potentially. I mean, maybe we are, but we can't be confident that we're on the bullseye, right? Our underlying construct is something about are you healthy, okay? All right. So, to give you some slightly clearer definitions here, validity. In theory, we're going to be thinking about validity as how well the indicator maps on to the outcome. All right. Our example being, do IQ tests truly measure this underlying construct of intelligence? Then reliability, we're going to think about that coming in at two different points. Is this measure Consistent and precise, right? That's going to be both about the mapping of the indicator onto the construct. It's also going to be about the mapping of the responses that we get onto the indicator, which in turn is being mapped onto the construct. Okay? So this reliability point, we're going to break this down into response reliability and also reliability of the indicator. Okay. Okay. So what do you think? Which is worse? Poor validity, poor reliability, they're both terrible, it depends. I have no idea. What do you guys think? Nobody's worried about reliability. Huh, okay. I'll try to convince you that you should be worried about all of it. All right, there's no right answer here. <laughs> they're, all, they're all something to worry about. Um, I'm not sure they're equally bad. I'm not sure it depends. I, I would say I don't know. 
Um, but no, they're all, they're all something to worry about. And what I want to do with the time that we have remaining is try to think a little bit together about how to minimize the concerns, how to ensure that, uh, that your measures are going to be as valid and reliable as possible. OK, so let's do a few more uh, little, little quizzes here. We're running a little bit behind. So give me your answers quickly. And then if you haven't weighed in, we'll just go with the, with the numbers that we have. OK, so the outcome that we want to affect is annual consumption. The way we're going to measure it is with food expenditure in the last week. Do you think this is a problem? Or do you think we're going to run into more problems with this on validity, reliability, both or neither? What do you think? OK. So there are going to be potentially some problems on both dimensions. All right. Um, the first on, uh, on reliability. So the question is, are we actually measuring something that looks like annual consumption when we just ask about expenditures in the last week? So maybe not. Maybe last week was a you know all out week, and you spent all sorts of money, and that actually has nothing to do with your typical consumption. Maybe last week you were at a JPAL training, and so you didn't actually spend all that much because they kept you locked up in a classroom all the time, right? So again, that might not be very representative. So it may be that our indicator is not a great proxy for our underlying construct. On the flip side, it's relatively easy to, measure, to remember what you spent money on last week. What if instead we were to say we wanted to measure our annual consumption with food expenditures in the last three months. Do you think there we'd run into more problems with validity, reliability, both or neither? OK, good. So we've got some trade-offs here, right? We went from the last one week, which was pretty easy to remember, but on average is not going to be very close to the annual pattern, right? Now we measure over three months. On the one hand, we're perhaps getting something that's a little bit more valid because it over three months, that looks a little bit more like what you typically do in a year. On the other hand, it's going to be really hard to remember what you did over the last three months, right? So you might forget a bunch of things, right? So we might be getting something that's a little bit biased in some way or potentially less reliable. But that's because of the response, right? So that's a response reliability problem. Now let's talk a little bit more about that. Let's think a little bit about the response process and where challenges can come up when we're thinking about responses. OK, this is going to be measurement error. We're going to talk a little bit about measurement error uh, for a while. OK, let's think about this response process. first. You ask a question, the respondent has to understand the question. That may seem like a trivial part of this problem. It's actually very, very difficult. You'll see that. You ask a question, they understand it. Then they have to go search in their brain a little bit, try to retrieve the information that you're after. Okay? Then they have to do some processing. Okay, So I've retrieved the information. Now I have to think about how to categorize it, how to shape it into the, into the response that you're after. And then finally, I have to tell you. And it may be that there are other reasons that I just don't want to give you the answer that I've come up with. And so I'll give you something that might be a little bit more socially acceptable. All right, let's think about each of these. An example. This nice enumerator here is asking this nice respondent here, how many times did you consume rice this month? Now, the respondent has to understand this question. This could turn out to be a little harder than it seems. All right. So the respondent may be thinking, OK, how many times did I consume rice this month? Does this guy mean rice just in a bowl that I ate just straight up? Does this mean any product that contained rice? Does this mean, you know, what does this mean exactly? Are they asking about rice as an ingredient? Are they asking about rice being directly consumed? Rice flour, rice crackers, rice noodles, what kind of rice? OK, so there might be a comprehension problem.
your turn to be a respondent. Tell me, do you prefer sitting or not? <laughs> OK, excellent. <laughs> You may have all understood that question a little bit differently, right? So what's the alternative? What alternatives did you think? What were you comparing sitting to? Lying. Lying down, doing jumping jacks, standing on your head, right? Sitting to what? Okay. So sitting to every other possible thing? If that's the question, then you know, probably not, right? But so in some ways, that was a very simple question. In other ways, your comprehension of that question may have varied widely uh, uh, within the room. Uh, the circumstances, right? Sitting in this classroom, sitting on an airplane, sitting in the mosh pit at a rock concert, I don't know. So depending on where you are, depending on what the alternatives are, it's not a particularly well-worded question. Let's think about the next stage here, retrieval of information. OK, how many times did I consume rice this month? So this individual is going to start thinking about, OK, how, how many times processing, trying to retrieve this information. Going to think about last week. Well, last week I ate rice twice. And I think that uh, that was a pretty representative week, about four weeks in a month. So we're going to say I ate rice about, about eight times. OK. Um, I guess so we skipped a little bit to judgment and estimation. So stop at two times. <laughs> the next step is going to be uh, getting to eight. OK, fine. Two rices, Monday, Thursday. All right, now your turn to be the respondent. When you received your first measles vaccine, on a scale of one to five, five one being painless, five being unbearably painful, what was your level of pain? OK, so <laughs> roughly what I would expect, somewhere in the middle, right? You don't remember, probably, the last time you received, you know, the first time you received a measles vaccination. For many of us, this was quite a while ago, right? So you're probably doing all sorts of weird approximations. All right, it was probably a typical shot. I don't know, right? I don't think it was much worse or much better. But who knows? I was really small. Maybe it was terrible. So. Somewhere in the middle, kind of safe answer. Terrible question, right? None of you can probably remember that, all right? So the idea that maybe you comprehended this question perfectly well, but you couldn't retrieve the information. That information is too distant memory. You can't actually retrieve that information. So 18 of you answered the question, right? I got some data out of it, but that data does not map on to what I actually care about measuring at all. OK? All right. Now, our respondent has to do a little math, right? I already did it, but we're now, I, I, I combined steps two and three. Step three is going to be all right, last week was a typical week. I had rice twice. Now, this person's asking me, how many times do I typically eat rice, or how many times did I eat rice in the last month? I think last week looked about like, the other weeks in the month. I think they're about four weeks in a month. So I'm going to give eight as my answer. Okay? So that's a little bit of judgment and estimation that has to happen, even on a very, very simple question, like how many times did you eat rice in the last month? Right? Now, what about you? How many calories do you think you consumed in your last large meal yesterday? OK. OK. Now, you probably had to do some judgment and estimation to get to these responses, right? So anybody want to volunteer their thought process briefly? Uh, actually, I mean, uh, I shot. Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, 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 no. OK, now tell us, tell us. No, I, I would say, I mean, like, 
like yeah. in the, the larger scheme of this, I actually lost a lot of weight many years ago, so I haven't told the company. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. so over time, that's become an automatic process. Uh -huh. I can estimate based on a lot of individual experiences yeah. what a single meal would be and what the largest meal would be of a set of meals. Good, but then you also probably had to break, you had to think about what what exactly did I eat during that meal, you had to think about portion sizes, you had to think about what you know about caloric content of each of these different foods, right? And you're coming at this from a very informed standpoint and it still required probably a fair amount of, of estimation, right? Um, so exactly, I mean this again is not a very straightforward question. I could have perhaps done better by breaking this question down for you and asking about individual foods, about portion sizes, about different things like that that would have made your answers a little bit more, uh, a little bit more accurate. Okay, fine. Then the last step is going to be turning this calculation that you've just done into a response. So again, our trusty respondent needs to now tell the enumerator how many times did you, I think we were doing eat rice, that says buy rice, eat rice uh, this month. Eight, right? So that's going to fall into this category. Good. What about you? It's anonymous. All right, it looks like we've got four abstentions. No, three abstentions, two abstentions. Okay, no, this is, this is not chosen to be funny. This is chosen to illustrate the fact that even after you go through the process of understanding the question, figuring out what your answer actually is, there may be things that then the process of communicating that to the enumerator, information breaks down, right? So in this case, We see what your answers are, okay? This is anonymous. Imagine I had gone up to each of you and asked you to your face. Your answers actually might have looked slightly different. Now, I could reword this question just a little bit. And these response categories, in some ways, are giving you permission to use a lot of drugs, all right? So if I really want an accurate measure, I might want to change these response categories a little bit. But even something like this can be a signal to the respondent of what's socially acceptable behavior here, right? So notice before, there were some pretty loaded terms up here, right? I said, if you, in the past 12 months, used drugs four times, you're a user. If you used it more than four times, you're an addict, right? That's pretty loaded. Turning it into something like this, while these, again, may not be the exact right categories to use, reframes the question in pretty dramatic ways, okay? So I want to spend a little bit of time with you, let's skip this one, thinking about measurement error, including for sensitive questions, and how to reduce, uh, how to reduce measurement error. All right, we're going to think about two things. Talked a little bit about validity error, now let's talk a little bit more about the response process and where measurement error actually, uh, actually comes in. Okay. So I'm going to go through a bunch of uh, example questions again to get you thinking about this. Um, we'll do this a little bit quickly. Okay, so where do you think the following question, do you live with a teenager? Where could it produce error? Validity, comp comprehension, retrieval, judgment estimation, or response? What do you think? So in some ways, this is to just get you thinking about the question. It doesn't necessarily fit tidily into these categories. Right, I'm going to cut you guys off. So I'm going to say, I'm going to agree with, you, with the majority here and say that comprehension is likely to be a problem here. Teenager, there's not a super clear definition. Is, is a 19-year-old? Teenager, 19-year-olds often don't live at home, so should we think about the 19-year-old who happens to be living at home still as a teenager, or are they an adult at that point? What about the 13-year-old? Okay, so this question needs a precise definition of what we're after, right? Maybe some age groups, for example. Okay, so this is a vague question. 
leaves interpretation up to the respondent, leaves the respondent the ability to say, I'm going to categorize that 19-year-old in one way or another. That's going to vary across respondents. And that's going to mean that our data are not particularly accurate representations, even of an indicator like living with a teenager, right? Something that should be relatively straightforward. OK. So we would need to clarify exactly what we mean by teenager. What about this question? What level of education have you obtained? Basic education, middle school, high school, college degree, postgraduate, or professional degree? Where do you think this question could produce error? Validity, comprehension, retrieval, judgment, estimation, or response? Okay. Good. Okay, so there certainly could be some comprehension problem. Right? If you are a high school dropout, where do you fit, right? Do you go in this category or this category? Right? These are not particularly well defined categories necessarily. We could add some categories for entered but didn't complete, for example, that would help make the responses a little bit clearer. It could also be a response problem, right? Um, maybe. The respondent wants you to think that they have some education. It's also an incomplete set of outcomes, right? There's no, no education at all category. Okay? So again, this question problematic on a number of different levels. Completeness. Uh, there's no, no education vocational degree. Think about a lot of different questions. We need this response categories to be collectively exhausted. Was there a question? Super yeah. Question you asked now. Validity. How can we judge validity if we don't know what the or that, yeah. is? No, no, no. So I'm putting these categories up here just to get you thinking about the question. All right. So they don't necessarily fall. Uh, yeah. I mean, you don't know exactly what it is that, that this project is trying to measure. Many of these, as you're saying, they fall into more than one of them. And the concepts I'm using them to illustrate are just more general concepts about problematic questions. So. Assign them to a category just to, to get your brain moving a little bit, OK? Um, assign validity if you want, right? That's the beauty of anonymous responses. <laughs> Do whatever you want. All right, good. Um, how about this question? Do you think that you should not let your children play contact sports? Where do you think there could be a problem with this one? So again, this is to really just get you thinking about what are the problems with this question. All right. They're meant to give you some slightly practical guidance. OK. So yeah, I think it's a little bit of a hard question to understand as well. And in particular, part of what makes it a hard question to understand is this use of the negative, right? So to ask somebody, do you think that you should not let your children play contact sports, you have to sort of do the, well, if I think I should, then that's a no, and right? It's, it's much more complicated. We could rephrase that to just say, do you think you should let your children, you should allow your children to play contact sports? Again, there are other problems with that question. What do we, what, how do you define a contact sport, right? Is ice skating a contact sport? If it's partner ice skating, maybe, I don't know, right? So problematic question on a number of dimensions. The big takeaway here is the use of negatives can throw a question off pretty dramatically, can change the interpretation of it. All right, what about this question? How many hours a day do you work? Where do you think the problems with that could come in? Look at the question. Less than an hour between one and four hours, between three and eight hours, between eight and 10 hours, more than 10 hours. Well, I think the big problem is probably a response problem, because look at these categories. right? 
somebody who works eight hours, where do you put them? Somebody who works four hours, where do you put them? Three hours, where do you put them? Right? So the wording here, you may quibble with that, but the real problem with this question is the idea that they're overlapping categories. Right? This would be a very easy question to improve, whether we got it exactly right just by making non-app overlapping categories or not, maybe not, but that would certainly be a starting point. Right? And this between 1 and 4 and 3 and 8 is particularly egregious. You see much more of, of this between 3 and 8 and 8 and 10. Right? There's no clear indication of which should include 8 hours. Right? So very simple questionnaire design issues like that can make a very big difference in the quality of data that you come away with, where some of your respondents will put themselves, who work eight hours, will put themselves here. Some of them will put themselves here. Overlapping category problem. A few more concrete examples. Um, how would you rate the quality of coffee this morning? Very good, somewhat good, not good. Remember, you don't get to answer that question. You have to instead tell us where you think the error is going to come in on this one. Did anybody not have coffee this morning? Oh, you doing all right? Um, yeah, no, but that's, that's the concern, right? There's no category for I didn't drink coffee. There's an assumption here, which is the same assumption I made, which is that everybody needs coffee in the morning, which I think is actually probably a pretty fair assumption, but uh, no. So this is um, assuming certain things about the respondent, right? This is particularly problematic when you go into a setting Oftentimes, J-PAL researchers are working in developing countries. We may not know everything about the country, right? We'll talk in a minute about piloting questionnaires, but oftentimes we bring our priors about the world into our research settings, into our evaluations, into our programs and policies, and make some assumptions about what the universe of possible answers even Yeah, so this could be judgment or estimation problem largely because there's a really big framing effect here, right? Again, this is language that's telling us treatment B allows 400 people to die. That's pretty heavy, right? These were terminally ill patients. These are actually equivalent treatments, right? Both of them are, if you assume those 600 people would have died anyway, 200 of them in both treatments A and B are walking away alive, right? So this is, this is a big topic in, in behavioral economics and psychology, this idea that how exactly you frame the question can have a really big impact on the types of responses that you get. Okay? So being very careful to use neutral framing so that you're not delivering a correct answer to people before they've even thought about it. All right, what about this one? How long did you wait the last time you voted? I'm going to go ahead and skip over your answers. Um, this might be a recall problem, right? The last time you voted was a while ago. The salient thing to you may not be how long you had to wait. The salient thing to you may be who you voted for, that you voted at all, other things about the experience, right? Um, some people may be better able to recall it than others. If it was very recent, it may be very easy. If I ask you this question again, November 15th, you might have a very different ability to recall than if I asked you today, right? So when exactly the survey happens relative to the event that you're asking about can matter a lot. And it also may be that I could change some wording and get very different answers. So if instead of just asking how long did you wait the last time you voted, I asked, in Arizona, some voters reported having to wait more than five hours to vote. How long did you have to wait? How might that change your response? And on the one hand, you might feel like it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't five hours, it wasn't that big of a deal, so you know, no time at all, don't worry about it. Or it could be that you think instead, five hours, gosh, that's a long time, voting must be really hard, and you get some anchoring bias. 
right? So you just heard five hours. Immediately, your mind goes to tedious voting lines, and you think about how long it takes. And so suddenly, your time may go up relative to what it was without that extra anchor of what happened in Arizona. OK, two more of these. How many meals have you eaten in the last one hour? This one you get to answer. Hmm. Some of you were sneaking food into this room. It's 2.44. You stopped eating at 1 o'clock. I haven't seen any, any of you eating. The point here is that recent events tend to loom much larger, right? So that lunch, certainly salient in at least some of your heads, right? And so that's being captured because of this recency, right? So things that happen tend to feel more recent if they're salient in your head. And so if you ask about a recall time period, you may be capturing things that happened well before that time just because they're salient in people's heads, OK? Um, now, last one. In the past year, did you say anything disparaging about academics to your colleagues? Yes or no? Oh, everybody answered that one. <laughs> OK, yeah, this was an anonymous survey. If I hadn't been standing here asking you, this number might have been even bigger, right? Most of you know I'm an academic. Um, if I went around and asked you to your face, this number might have been even smaller. I would at least hope that you have the decency. Um, this is an example of social desirability bias, OK? This idea that there are certain things that you may not want to say because of the identity of the enumerator, because of what's socially acceptable, because of all sorts of other things. This was very related to the drug use question, right? That there are certain things that are just easier to talk about than others. And so if we need to measure those, because that's part of our, the underlying contract that we're trying to impact, then how we design the questionnaire, who it is that's administering it, how it's being administered, can all affect uh, the quality of the data that we get out of it. I think I am way over time, guys. So here's our laundry list of problems, right? You can mull over that. Um, Quick time check. So we go till. That's what I thought. OK. Um, let's see. Let me go through this very quickly. And I'm afraid it may eat up most of your coffee break, but uh, hopefully it'll be useful. OK. Few quick tips. These are this is really just a list of pointers, um, so you can read it on your own as well. But let's go through it quickly. So tips for designing questions. Breaking we saw this with the with uh, with some of the examples. Breaking complex questions into smaller questions. How many calories did you eat at your last big meal? Asking instead about what was eaten, quantities, things like that could be very helpful. With close-ended questions, making sure that the list of response options is exhaustive, is crucial, right? All reasonable possibilities. Making the questions as specific as possible with the exception of sensitive questions. For sensitive questions, actually being a little bit more involved, letting the respondent become a little bit more comfortable with what it is that you're trying to understand can actually be helpful. So this longer question thing pertains only to more sensitive questions. Sorry, and you can think about this as, uh, as also response time. So asking about very recent events, you're going to tend to get more accurate answers. Here as well, for sensitive questions, spreading it out, the response time, giving people the room to say, oh, I used to do that, I don't do that anymore, uh, can actually be helpful. Obviously, making sure that the wording is easy to comprehend, Bundling sensitive questions together so you get it over with and you don't have the person uncomfortable throughout the two-hour survey. Um, 
Using visual cues can actually be very helpful. So there are a bunch of innovative measurement techniques that use visual clues that let cues that let the respondent take some interpretation of the question away from, uh, from visuals. Using them consistently is very important. Once you use a visual once, you need to make sure that it's being used in the same way. That can be a very easy way to confuse people. Warming people up a little bit with some kind of friendly chit chat at the beginning, the easy questions first before you get to the real, uh, the real tricky ones. Grouping questions on the same topic can lower confusion. That can help respondents understand what the survey is even about, what it is that you're asking about. Filters, this is an example of uh, what I was describing with the computer, um, with the automated questionnaires, where depending on what you've answered before, that can direct you uh, toward skipping some questions, asking others, so using filters to avoid asking a respondent who just told you they don't have any kids the ages of their kids, right? All right, and then the last thing is, just to say very briefly, piloting a survey is so useful, right? Making sure that you don't just sit in your office at your computer designing, and here I say survey, but any data collection that you're using, making sure that it's actually measuring what it is you want it to measure, right? Making sure that you're actually getting the information out of it that you think you're getting is very key. Response reliability is all about, you, you learn a lot about it during piloting. So pre-testing it in a smaller setting with respondents that are similar to your ultimate group of interest, right? Testing it out, seeing what responses you get, and then debriefing with them, asking them, did you understand this? What was confusing? What did you, how did you interpret that question that I asked you? What did you think I meant? And then finally, turning to those who have potentially more experience than you and trying to, to see, you know, what do you think of this questionnaire? That also means not necessarily inventing it from scratch, but rather going and finding tested examples of this in, that have been used in other places and adapting them to your setting. Things to look for. If you have some questions that a lot of people are skipping or saying don't apply or something like that, that is not something wrong with the respondent. That is something wrong with your questionnaire. All right? That means that there's something about this question that is actually not going to be helping you at the end of the day. If respondents want to give more than one answer, and you really just want them to give one answer, again, that means that something about that question needs to be edited, needs to be revised. And then often what we do to just protect ourselves is to have some category that says other in case we actually made a mistake and didn't have a complete set of outcomes. If a third or two thirds or three quarters of your responses are in that other category, again, that means that you need to do some thinking about, uh, about this question. All right, other things to consider. Wording we've talked about, answer choices, how you want to set up if it's a Likert scale from one to five, one being bad, five being excellent, one to seven better, one to four, how do you want to scale that? Um, translation is an important one. What we often do if you're working in a different language is translate it first into the other language and then back into English to make sure it's a better way of checking that, that there wasn't some wording confusion that, that arose during the translation. Making sure that surveyors are very well trained and very good is very challenging, but crucial. You can have the best questionnaire on the planet, and if you have bad enumerators, you're not going to get good data out of it. Finally, be respectful of your respondents. Uh, be careful of length and fatigue, and on that note, let's be done. Um, so thank you guys for putting up with, uh, with going over time. All right.